Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for our first daily dose of Kamigawa Neon Dynasty spoilers, and oh my goodness, we just started spoiler season today officially, and it feels like half the set has been released already. We got about a million cards to talk about, we got three new Planeswalkers, a ton of Mythics, new mechanics, really crazy, really powerful, really awesome, exciting stuff, which means we should probably jump right into it. Start talking sweet new Kamigawa Neon Dynasty cards. Before we do, a couple of quick reminders. One is, if you're looking to keep up on all the latest spoilers throughout the day, you can do that over at mtgpreviews.com. Number two, if you need some Kamigawa Neon Dynasty cards, you can get them from our amazing sponsor, Card Kingdom, by heading over to cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. Even get a free goldfish sticker, just let them know you want one in your order notes, and they will hook you up. So let's talk some Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. All right, so we're kicking things off with some new Planeswalkers, starting with the return of one of my favorite Planeswalkers, Tamiyo Completed Sage. So Tamiyo, oh, poor Tamiyo, been Phyrexian eyes since we've last seen her. Five mana, sort of. Actually, maybe it's four mana. It has a completed mechanic. You see that weird mana symbol in the middle, a mana symbol we've never seen before. Tamiyo's mana cost is two, a green, a blue, and a hybrid Simic Phyrexian mana symbol. You can pay for that mana symbol with either two life, a green, or a blue. And then it has this completed mechanic where if you choose to pay life, Tamiyo comes into play with two less loyalty. So essentially, you can cast Tamiyo for five mana and have it come into play with five loyalty or for four mana and two life, but she's going to come into play with just three loyalty. As far as abilities, plus one, tap up to one artifact or creature, does untap during its controller's next untap step. So some good defense, tap down something that could attack Tamiyo perhaps. Negative X, exile a non-land permanent with mana value X from your graveyard, create a token that's a copy of that card so kind of simic reanimation and then negative seven create tamio's notebook a legendary colorless artifact token with spells you cast cost two less to cast and tap it to draw a card weird note on that last ability that's not an emblem that's actually just an artifact token which means it can be destroyed which is really 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 strange uh, pretty much every Planeswalker Ultimate we've ever seen like this has an emblem if it's an ability like that. Well, Tamiyo's is not. It is just an artifact token, so your opponent could abrade it or rip apart it or Prismari command it or whatever. So as far as Tamiyo is concerned, this card is really interesting. If you look at the abilities, the plus one kind of reminds me of Tamiyo the Moon Sage, a nice callback to our original Tamiyo. A little bit worse because you can only tap artifacts and creatures. Part of the power of Tamiyo and Moon Sage was you could tap down lands, which is really, really strong. But still, being able to tap down any artifact or creature, a good way to slow down something that could be beating down your Tamiyo. The negative X, I couldn't find a perfect comparison. It's a brand new ability. Exile a non-land from your graveyard with mana value X, make a token copy of it. It's essentially like a Obsidat's aid with a mana cost restriction, being able to reanimate any permanent. We've seen a lot of green cards that return permanents to your hand. This is the first one that exiles it and gives you a token, but still a potentially powerful effect. And then the token, a cost reduction of two on all your spells is actually insane ramp. We've seen that with Ugin the Ineffable, which only does that to colorless spells, but still Ugin allows for some really explosive turns where you play and just chain together a ton of spells. I think that Tamiyo's notebook token is going to do something similar and then it also works kind of like a howling mine for as long as it's on the battlefield you can just tap it to draw a card so a lot of value offered by the ultimate the question for tamio is what do you do with this card we don't really have a top tier simic deck in standard i think in a generic deck is this better than ren in seven Ugh, I'm actually not convinced. The upside of being able to cast it for four mana, thanks to the weird Phyrexian hybrid mana, that is legitimate. That is a big bonus, but just ability for ability, I think that Ren's probably a little bit more powerful than Tamiyo. The token Ren makes is just so, so big. So I think in a generic deck, I'd rather have Ren. On the other hand, we have a lot of stuff that cares about the graveyard. We have this self-mill theme in Simic where uh, we want to just get stuff in the graveyard and then we benefit from it with Death Bonnet Hawks and Vile Spawn Spine and Grolmox, and Tamiyo does seem really well suited there. It can play a little bit of defense. The token it makes with the ultimate is really good, and as we mill stuff over, we'll probably mill stuff over we want to reanimate and can get it back with Tamiyo. So Tamiyo, I love the design. Really, really cool card. Not exactly sure where it fits in standard, but it seems like it has enough power that it could show up somewhere eventually. 
We also got a new Tezzeret, Tezzeret Betrayer of Flesh. So Tezzeret, four mana, four loyalty. The first activated ability of an artifact you activate during each turn costs two less to activate. Plus one, draw two cards, discard two cards, unless you discard an artifact card. Uh, so if you discard an artifact, you're only discarding one, essentially. Negative two, target artifact becomes an artifact creature. If it isn't a vehicle, its base power and toughness becomes four or four. If it is a vehicle, you just get the vehicle's power and toughness, which is hopefully an upgrade in most cases. And then negative six, you get an emblem with whenever an artifact you control becomes tapped, draw a card. So Tezzeret, another one of my favorite Planeswalkers. Wizards really nailing it with the Planeswalkers returning in Kamigawa. This card actually seems pretty good. My first thought was, Hmm, this reminds me a little bit of Tezzeret Agent of Bolas. If you think about it, plus ones that draw cards, negatives that turn artifacts into big creatures, an emblem that can win the game in one way or another. The ultimates are very, very different, and it does take Tezzeret Materia Flesh a lot longer to get there. But still, if you're drawing an extra three, four, seven cards each turn, it is going to allow you to close out the game anyway. Plus, you get the bonus of that static ability, which is a little bit weird, but it does offer a little extra bonus. So if you think about these abilities, the plus one, it's essentially Thirst for Knowledge. Thirst for Knowledge, I know it says draw three and then discard two unless you discard an artifact. Well, that's because you're actually casting the Thirst for Knowledge. Tezzeret stays on the battlefield, so drawing two on a Planeswalker that you still have access to is actually very similar to drawing three off Thirst for Knowledge. So that's compared to number one. The negative two essentially turns an artifact into a 4-4, same as Black Staff of Waterdeep, which we've seen see a bit of play in Historic, a little bit in Standard as well, so a pretty powerful effect with the upside of being even better with vehicles and then the emblem just an absurd source of card advantage as far as the static ability i think the most obvious way to take advantage of it is equipment uh, equip costs are activated abilities so essentially the first thing you equip each turn is going to be negative two mana so your mall of the skyclaves is two mana or whatever so that by itself is pretty powerful but you could also like activate your treasure chest on the cheap or use maskwood nexus to make tokens on the cheap so none of these are like super broken synergies but they're are a lot of things you can do with that static ability. I think the thing I'm most excited about with Tezzeret, though, is the negative two with vehicles. We've seen cards in the past that take and turn artifacts into creatures that are 4-4s four or 5-5s, five uh, kind of like Tezzeret Agent of Bolas. The problem is, this is actually a drawback with some vehicles. I've tried to build decks, actually, uh, in the past. Big brain decks, where I, like, use a in-soul artifact on Consulent Dreadnought. The problem is, the Consulent Dreadnought is still going to be a 4-4 four, four or a 5 Five, five. It's not going to get its vehicle power and toughness. Tezzeret Betrayer of Flesh, I believe, is one of the only ways, a very, very rare effect that actually turns Consulate Dreadnought into a 7-11. It turns Colossal Plow into a 6-3. So I think that's a really neat upside. And we do have Colossal Plow in standard. Like, that works really well with Tezzeret. Consulate Dreadnought maybe in Historic or something. So I think that's a really fun way to build around Tezzeret. It's also possible to just, uh, you know, animate Pithy Needles, animate Portable Holes, some random artifacts on the battlefield turning them into beatdown threats to close out the game. So Tezzeret, I think this card's pretty sweet. It's like a lot of older Tesserets. Some of them have been hits for Constructed. Some of them have been whiffs. I think this one has a chance. We're going to have to wait and see. I think this is a card that's going to make more sense a week from now, in a year from now, than it does right now. We haven't really been in an artifact standard recently. We haven't had any big artifact sets recently. However, it looks like Kamigawa is going to have a lot of artifacts. And then we know we're going to do Brothers War to Urza and Mishra, and that's almost certainly going to be artifact focus. So even if if Tezzeret doesn't take off right away, I think this is a card that probably will get there sooner or later. It kind of does what you want. Card advantage, protecting yourself with a negative two, an ultimate that should get the game done, and a reasonable static ability too. Finally, Planeswalker number three, we have the Wandering Emperor. I still don't really know who the Wanderer is. You'd notice this is the only Planeswalker ever that doesn't have a name in the type line. We still don't know the Wanderer's name. It's just Legendary Planeswalker. And this is another super unique planeswalker the wandering emperor four mana three loyalty it has flash as long as wandering emperor entered the battlefield this turn you may activate her loyalty abilities anytime you could cast an instant and then plus one put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target creature it gains first strike until end of turn negative one make a two two white samurai creature token with vigilance negative two exile a tap creature you gain two life so the wandering emperor 
is something we've never seen before. It's a planeswalker that's essentially a combat trick. You can flash this in during combat on your turn, on your opponent's turn, and activate the Wandering Emperor at instant speed. So you can wait until your opponent blocks, and then you can flash in the Wandering Emperor and uh, seize the initiative. Uh, not even a good comparison. Seize the initiative is worse than the Wandering Emperor's plus one, but essentially give a creature first strike and a pump, so hopefully you blow your opponent out. You can wait until your opponent attacks, flash it in, make a 2-2 Samurai as a blocker, or just expel away an attacking creature. And I think the main way to take advantage of the Wandering Emperor is to try to play it during your opponent's turn. If you think about how Planeswalkers work, you can only activate them during your turn. The Wandering Emperor has an exception. If you cast it this turn, you can use her loyalty abilities anytime you could cast an instant. So this means you can flash it in and use it during your opponent's turn, which is really, really powerful because this means you can essentially double up your activations. If you play the Wandering Emperor on your turn four, you activate it and you gotta wait till your turn five to do it. If you flash it on your opponent's turn, you can activate it, untap, activate it again. So I think that's gonna be the main goal is to try to get that first activation during your opponent's turn. The other upside of the Wandering Emperor compared to Tezzeret or Tamiyo is it's already got a ready built home. If you think about what the Wandering Emperor wants. It's a white base deck with a lot of creatures to take advantage of all the pump abilities, and Mono White Aggro already a really good deck in standard, so I could see some number of the Wandering Emperors just immediately being slotted into the top end of Mono White Aggro. On the other hand, I was pretty high on Grandmaster of Flowers when it was spoiled, and Grandmaster of Flowers has done essentially nothing, so I don't want to say Wandering Emperor is going to be insane, but I think that its combination of uniqueness with the flash abilities and being able to activate it during your opponent's turn with a ready mill home does make me relatively hopeful that it can probably do something in standard. So the Wandering Emperor, we still don't know who she is, but we have literally never seen a Planeswalker like this before, and it's going to be really interesting once we get a chance to start playing with the cards to see just how good it might actually be. Next up in the world of mad things, we got the return of Jengataxias with Jengataxias Progress Tyrant. So seven mana, legendary Frexian Praetor, of course, five, five. Whenever you cast an artifact instant or sorcery spell, copy that spell. You can choose new targets for the copy. This ability only triggers once each turn. And whenever your opponent casts an artifact instant or sorcery spell, counter that spell. This ability triggers only once each turn. So Jenga Taxi is, of course, really awesome Phyrexian language version. I love the Phyrexian language cards. This version of Jen is pretty interesting. So this is our second Jen. After Jenga Taxi is Core Augur, new Jen actually seems seems like it can be pretty strong. I'm not sure how strong it'll be in standard, but if you think about what this does, it's a little bit like a once per turn swarm intelligence combined with a once per turn array once it's flipped, like being able to copy your first instant sorcery artifact and counter your opponent's first instant sorcery artifact, that's a pretty strong effect. So my question for Jin in standard is, is anyone really gonna play it over Hallbreaker Horror? So the upside of Jin is it offers value, like copying your stuff is just an innately powerful effect, and it does kind of protect itself. Like, you play this, your opponent goes to cast an instant or a sorcery to kill it, and it's gonna get countered, so it's gonna make it challenging for your opponent to get off the battlefield. On the other hand, it is pretty safe. It's not gonna combo off like a thousand year storm or something because of the once per turn restriction. So as far as standard is concerned, I honestly think, I don't know if Jin will see play at all. Like I think that the decks that would want Jin are the same decks that already play Hullbreaker Horror. And I'm not sure that Jin is anywhere near as strong as Hullbreaker Horror in a 60 card format. That said, if you wanna go deep, there are funny ways to build around it. Uh, in standard, Jin Gitaxius plucks Archon of Amiria. Archon of Amiria says, each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. Well, Jin makes it so the first instant sorcery or artifact your opponent casts is gonna be countered. So this kind of just locks instant sorceries and artifacts out of the game as far as your opponent's concerned. They just cannot play those. So all they can play is what? Creatures and planeswalkers. So your Jin's gonna live forever. Your opponent's gonna have a hard time dealing with it. You do the same thing with like deafening silence in older formats. So there are shenanigans. If you wanna try to build like Jin Gitaxius Lock, Jin Gitaxius Prison, which sounds at least like a really fun against the odds deck. Although from a competitive perspective, like I said before, I think that Hullbreaker Horror just wins. On the other hand, as a commander, oh my goodness, Jenga Taxi seems really strong. I mean, it seems just annoying in commander overall, where you have three opponents, so you're hopefully gonna be countering something during each of their turns, and you're gonna have a bunch of opponents' turns that you might be able to take advantage of. Plus, there's some combo potential. Like, one way to get around the once per turn restriction with Jen is to flick 
flicker it. If you flicker Jin with like a ghostly flicker, it becomes a new Jin, even though it's the same exact card. Uh, so then you'd be able to copy another spell each turn. So combo wise, something like ghostly flicker, Archaeomancer to get back the ghostly flicker, and then like Coveted Jewel, Gilded Lotus to make mana. Let you go infinite. You ghostly flicker, hit the Archaeomancer and the Jin, and you get a copy of it. So you can blink your Coveted Jewel or Gilded Lotus. Everything comes back into play untapped. If you got Coveted Jewel, you're going to draw cards. Your Jin is new. So then you get back the ghostly flicker with Archaeomancer's ETB trigger. Do it again. Do it again. Draw your entire deck. Maybe make infinite mana or whatever. So there are mono blue combo potential here. At the same time, if you want to build around this, the other way to go is to try to cast stuff during your opponent's turn. Remember, it's once per turn restriction applies to each turn. So if you're playing commander, if you can cast in artifact, instant or sorcery during everyone's turn, once in your turn, your first opponent's turn, second, third, you get a ridiculous amount of value out of this card. Plus, you got stuff that lets you cast everything with flash. I think the most powerful part of Jen is the copying of artifacts, and we have stuff like Shimmer Mirror, Videl Kinori, Lane Live and Anticipation, because remember, we got a ton of ways to copy instants and sorceries. Like, that's something we've done for a long time. Swarm Intelligence, Thousand Year Storm, arguably better ways than Jin to copy instants and sorceries. Copying artifacts, though, that is pretty unique. So I think building the, like, flash artifact deck with Jin leading the way actually seems super fun, and then you just cast Worm Coil Engines and Thran Dynamos, whatever big random artifacts, casting on each of your opponent's turns until you generate an overwhelming amount of value and win the game. So Jin Gitaxias, really interesting to see the Phyrexian Praetors returning. This has got to be leading to something. we got to be going back to new Phyrexia or something next year. Like, that's got to be where this is heading. For now, seems like a really powerful and probably pretty annoying to play against Commander card. In Standard, might just be a bad hole break horror. Although, with some fun, janky combo potential with, like, Archon of Amiria. Next on our list, we got a couple more dragon spirits in the mythic slot, starting with our white member of the cycle, Ao the Dawn Sky. So five mana, five, four dragon spirit, flying in vigilance. When it dies, you get to choose one of two options. Option one is look at the top seven cards of your library, put any number of non-land permanent cards with total mana value four or less from among them on the battlefield and put the rest on the bottom in any order or put two plus one plus one counters on each permanent you can control that's a creature or a vehicle so ao I think this card is actually like legitimately good. It does everything that you want for a constructed card. Uh, it has a good body, five mana, five, four flying vigilance. That's fine. And then worst case, it replaces itself when it dies. It replaces itself with less mana value worth of permanence, but still having your five drop die and getting a four drop or multiple lower mana value cards. That's exactly what you want out of a competitive card. So it reminds me a little bit of, honestly, Matter Reshaper is the best comparison I could find for its first death trigger. Uh, obviously, Matter Reshaper only looks at the top card. AO's less likely to whiff. Going seven cards deep, if your deck's built around it at all, you should be able to get four mana value worth of effects. And then the second ability, we actually don't have a card that's just put two plus one plus one counters on everything. I think Vastwood Surge Kicked is the closest I could find. Uh, and that's a really powerful ability as well. So I think the AO, it's really, really hard for this to be a bad card. If you think about how this is going to play, I'm assuming you're going to play it in something like White Weenie, let's say, or something something along those lines. If you're behind on board and your AO dies, well, then you dig seven cards deep to rebuild your board. Try to grab some Usher of the Fallen, or Luminarchus Byrance, or Adelaine, some combination. On the other hand, if you're ahead when it dies, well, then you just put counters on things and smash your opponent to death really quickly. So I think the AO definitely has the look of a card. They should be able to see a decent amount of play in standard. It's just a really powerful effect that replaces itself when it dies and can force through even more damage if you're ahead. We all also got our blue dragon spirit, Kiari the Swirling Sky. So Kiari, six mana, six, six, flying in ward. When it dies, choose one of return any number of non-land permanents with total mana value six or less to their owner's hands or mill six cards and return up to two instant or sorcery cards from your graveyard to your hand. So Kiari, it's first death trigger. Yeah, it's really hard to evaluate. Like, depending on the board state, you could just be bouncing one big thing like Dream Eater, or you might be able to bounce most of your opponent's stuff like a Cyclone Summoner. So some amount of value. On the other hand, if you're playing some sort of control deck with a lot of spells, you essentially get a Scholar of Ages. Getting back two instances of sorceries and milling to hit good ones, that's a lot of card advantage. You're drawing two cards when it dies. The other thing I love about Kiari is that it's just, it's massive. We've been talking about all these other big flyers, the Spirit Dragons, we got gold 
cold span. We got flipped smothering eggs in standard. There's a ton of big, powerful flyers that see play in standard. Kiari is one of the biggest, and he just shuts down all the other ones. In some weird way, it reminds me a little bit of Ren in 7, where part of the power of Ren is, you play it, you take it down to make this big token, and that token just stonewalls Goldspan Dragon, it stonewalls all the other dragons, and the Smoldering Egg, Kiari can do the same thing, and Kiari probably has potential to show up in the Is It Dragon decks as well, like this could be a great top end of your curve threat in some sort of Dragon style deck. So Kiari, yeah, I mean, seems really solid. Good body, a bit of protection, and two relevant drive death triggers. I would rank it a little bit behind AO overall. I think AO is actually just really, really strong. Uh, its death triggers are just so, so good for the decks that don't want to play it. But Kiari, eh, it's got a big body. It's hard to kill. And when it dies, you're going to get some value out of it in pretty much any situation. If you're behind that board, you bounce your opponent's stuff to stay alive. If you're ahead, well, get some spells from your graveyard and try to use them to close out the game. All right, our last mythic for the day shows off a new take on sagas coming in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, the Kami War. So the Kami War, six mana in all five colors. Uh, first lower counter, exiles a non-land permanent opponent controls. This second one bounces up to one other non-land permanent and then makes each opponent discards. The third lower counter, this is where it gets weird. Normally, after the third lower counter, you just put your sake to the graveyard, it goes away. Well, the new take from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, the third lore counter exiles the saga and returns it to the battlefield transformed as a creature in the case of the kami war that creature is okagachi made manifest a six six flying tremble that's all colors and when it attacks the defending player chooses a non-land card in your graveyard and it returns it to your hand and okagachi is plus x plus zero until end of turn where x is a card's mana value so smashing in for a ton of damage so i gotta say these designs are really interesting uh, it seems like we had a ton of weird takes on trans Transform. I will definitely admit that I was not expecting sagas that transform into creatures being on the list for Kamigawa Neon Dynasty, but it's definitely a really cool idea. Just how powerful the mechanic is. Uh, that's another question. It is really, really slow. As far as the Kami War itself, uh, you essentially get an utter end into a recoil, into this big flyer. Of course, it's going to take forever. Like, let's say you cast it on turn six, you get to exile something. Turn seven, you get to bounce something. Turn eight, you're going to exile and transform. That's going to mean your Okagachi has summoning sickness. So turn nine would be your first time to attack with it, unless you're ramping. And that's going to be a common theme with all these sagas. Uh, they're just really, really slow. However, I mean, it is pretty powerful. The biggest problem I think in standard is the five color thing. Like, it's nice that you get this big flyer and it gives you this weird treasury thrall ability to recur things that your opponent controls. Like, that's all a lot of upside. But in standard, what deck's going to be five colors and want this really, really slow card when we have all the spirit dragons and we have all the random dragons? Like, if you just want a big, powerful flyer, we have tons of them. If you just want removal, we got stuff like Binding of the Old Gods. So I don't think this card is really designed for standard. I think where this shines is probably in commander and in commander I would consider playing the Kami War in pretty much any five color deck in my removal slot. Like, exiling anything is really, really huge. Like, I know it doesn't hit lands, but I really value removal that doesn't really have conditions on it in Commander. Because Commander, you got powerful artifacts, enchantments, planeswalkers on occasion, along with creatures. The Kami War gets rid of any of those. Sure, it's a little expensive. Like, six mana is a lot when other, other end is four, but you get all these additional upsides. So, I think in Commander, the Kami War is worth at least considering as removal plus it's just like a really neat design but in standard i don't think it's gonna make the cut the good news is we actually have a ton of these weird saga creature cards we had a couple of rare ones we saw today uh, the dragon kami reborn slash dragon kami's egg this card it's a really fun design so three mana saga the first two lore counters let you gain two life and let you look at the top three cards of your library and exile one of them face down with a hatching counter on it and put the rest on the bottom the third lore counter Again, transforms it into a creature. The creature is Dragon Kami's egg, a zero one egg that when it or a dragon dies, you can cast a creature spell from among the cards you own with exile with hatchling counters on them without paying its mana cost. So Dragon Kami Reborn, it reminds me of Summoner's Egg, essentially clone shell. The idea of this is you play it as a saga, hope to spin into something massive, a coma or a cultivator colossus, a tox roll, and then eventually when your Dragon Kami's egg dies, you get to cast that big thing for free and you're even 
casting it. So you're going to get any cast triggers if you got Eldrazi or whatever. So this is a card I'm definitely excited to build in against the odds deck with. Like, just play this along with big things in sacrifice outlets like Immerstorm Fetter, Awaken the Blood Avatar, Skullport Merchant, and just hope for the best. But from a, like, spiky perspective, I would be surprised if it was actually competitive. The other risk is you could whiff with it. Like, it is very possible that you play this and you don't have a good creature in your top three, and then you're not going to have much with hatch encounters, and then it gets much, much worse. Like, if you're not getting a good creature exiled to eventually play with the egg, this card is really, really unplayable. Uh, it is cute in Commander, is specifically in Atla Polini decks, because Atla Polini cares about eggs and wants eggs to die, and triggers when eggs die to put big things into play. Dragon Kami's egg is an egg, so you're going to get a ridiculous amount of triggers and put a ton of big things into play. So I think, at worst, seems like a good new addition for Atla decks. As far as other places, my guess is it's a cool budget or against the odds card, but probably not super competitive. We also got teachings of the Kirin slash Kirin Touch Orochi. So another Saga into enchantment creature card. Saga side, two mana. Lore counter one, mill three cards, make a one one colorless spirit creature token. Lore counter two, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Lore counter three, exile it comes back transformed is Kirin Touch Orochi, a 1-1 snake monk, a legendary enchantment creature that when it attacks, exile target creature from a graveyard. When you do, make a 1-1 colorless spirit creature token or exile target non-creature from the graveyard. When you do, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. So this card, I love the flavor of it. I love its callback to Forbidden Orchard. We haven't had non-flying colorless spirits in a long time. That's a very Kamigawa thing. So I'm glad they've made their return. As far as this scene play though, oh my goodness. Like, look at this compared to Ranger class. Ranger class makes a 2-2 right away. Teachings of the Karen makes a 1-1 and mill some cards right away. Ranger class, you level it up for two mana and you put counters on attacking creatures every turn, teachings of the Karen, a single counter, and then you get to cast creatures off the top of your deck. Eventually, teachings of the Karen flips around into a 1-1. One, one. Like, teachings of the Karen is just way, way, way too slow. At the backside, you might be like, okay, graveyard hate. At least it gives us graveyard hate, but we got a ton of cards that do that. We got graveyard trespasser, cemetery prowler, so incidental graveyard hate on a creature just isn't that important. There's so many ways to do it. So if Teachings of the Karen sees play, I think it's got to be in a deck that takes advantage of its types, like hollowed, haunting, enchantress-style decks. I think that's what we're going to be looking for because there's a standalone threat. Just think through this card. You play it on turn two, you get a 1-1. One, one. On turn three, you get the second lower counter. Your 1-1 one, one becomes a 2-2, two, two. or you could put the counter on something else. On turn four, you transform it. It comes back summoning sick. Turn four five you can attack with a one one like what are the odds in a game of even standard that you're actually going to be able to successfully attack and snowball this for value on turn five it seems like the answer is basically zero percent of the time so teachings of the karen i don't think this can really see play but keep an eye out for other enchantment synergies because i think maybe that's where these new sagas can shine since we're talking about the new sagas into enchantment creature cards might as well just go through the lower rarity ones quickly Again, like a lot of cool designs and you can check them all out over at mtgpreviews.com. I love the life of Tashiro Yumazawa's callback to Yumazawa's Jite. Uh, like Portrait of Mikio could be pretty good in the right deck. A 0, zero that gets plus one, plus one for each artifact or enchantment you control. It itself is an enchantment creature. Could be a pretty big body. But in general, these cards all just feel really, really so to me. So we'll have to wait and see. Maybe they play better than I think, but they seem like it's going to take a really, really long time until you eventually get the creature side and then in some cases especially with these like common ones the creature is only okay the uncommon and rare and mythic creatures are actually pretty powerful but when you get to the lower rarity ones and a 2-2 two, two first strike go 2-3 flyer more stuff for limited i think so i like the idea of these cards just how playable they're going to be in standard gonna have to wing and see of course it wouldn't be kamigawa without ninjas and ninjutsu and we got a few interesting ninjas to look at today. So first up, we got Silver for Older Master, essentially a two mana ninja lord. Uh, so two mana Demir Rat Ninja gives your other ninjas and rogues plus one plus one, and it makes your ninjutsu abilities cost one less to activate, and you can ninjutsu it if you want to for two mana, which I don't know, you can cast it for two mana, so I'm not exactly sure why you want to ninjutsu it unless you're trying to use ninjutsu to pick up, you know, a Muldrift or something with ETB that you want to reuse. But two mana lords with upside, traditionally pretty good in magic. So I think that Silver for Master, at least in Standard Ninjas, probably has a chance. In older formats, 
I'm a little bit more skeptical. In older formats, I really want to be Ninjutsu Wing, Ingenious Infiltrator, Ninja the Deep Hours on turn two to start drawing cards. Not Ninjutsu Wing, a 2 2 ground lord. Um, ninjas just, I don't know if they care about power that much. Like, I don't know if the power is that important compared to being able to, like, snowball card advantage. So, seems like a cool standard card. Not sure about older formats. On the other hand, Binding Palm Ninja, I think this card is legitimately one of the best ninjas that we've seen. So, 3 mana, 3 3. Ninjutsu of 3. Enters a battlefield with a menace counter on it. When it deals combat damage to a player, you can remove the menace counter. When you do, that player reveals their hand, and you choose a non-land from it and exile it. This card is absurd. So sure, it's Sinjitsu is three mana, not a discount over its casting cost, but you're getting a really powerful trigger when you hit your opponent. This reminds me of Vindillion Click, Elite Spellbinder, cards that have seen play across formats. These three drops that essentially allow you to thought seize your opponent, take a card out of your opponent's hand, are really, really good. So the downside of Biting Palm Ninja is it's not an ETB trigger. Its Thought Seize effect is when it hits your opponent. So you pretty much want to ninjutsu it and get in that sneaky attack. On the other hand, the upside is it's just a straight up Thought Seize that exiles. You don't even lose life. Vindelian Click Elite Spellbinders, they have drawbacks. Like Spellbinder, you're taxing a card, but your opponent's going to cast it eventually. Vindelian Click, your opponent draws another card. And so they're going to replace whatever you take. I think that Biting Palm Ninja... This, to me, looks like a ninja that has potential to see play in standard, in historic, all the way back to modern, perhaps. Like, I'm really, really high on this card. Hopefully, it doesn't prove me wrong, but I think this might be just, like, top tier, one of the best ninjas that Wizards has ever printed. Speaking of really good ninjas, we also got Thousand Face Shadow, and this is a ninja that really excites me for a very different reason. So, it's a one-mana, one-one human ninja. You can ninjitsu it for four. It has flying, and when it enters a battlefield from your hand, if it's attacked, so essentially, if you ninjutsu it, create a token that's a copy of another target attacking creature. That token enters the battlefield tapped in attacking. I think this card is bonkers. So the big reason I'm so excited about this card is not so much its token making attacking creature ability. Like, we've seen this ability before on like Flame Rush Rider, Delina Wild Mage. The upside of Thousand Face Shadow is it's not until end of turn. You're getting a permanent copy of another attacking creature. So I don't want to diminish the upside of that. Like, that is really powerful. Because being able to get another Ingenious Infiltrator or Ninja of the Deep Powers, whatever. What really excites me about Thousand Face Shadow is this is a one mana one one flyer. If you look at ninja decks, step one of making ninjutsu work is playing an evasive creature on turn one. You see modern ninjas playing stuff like Fairy Seer just because they want this one mana one one flyer. Thousand Face Shadow, that does that. And later in the game, if you draw it off the top of your deck, it's not horrible like a Fairy Seer or a Changeling Outcast. Then you can ninjutsu it into play, get a copy of something. So I think this is a new staple one drop of Ninja Drex across formats. Like this is a card that on turn one, you play it. And then on turn two, you ninjutsu your Ingenious Infiltrator or your Silver for Master. And then later when it comes off the top, it's copying your Infiltrator or Silver for Master, whatever. So, so powerful. This is exactly what I want out of Ninjas. And I would not be the least bit surprised if this is a new staple one drop for Ninja decks pretty much across formats. Next up, we have Mirror Box, another cool, flavor callback so mirror box three mana artifact it says the legend rule doesn't apply to permanence you control each legendary creature you control gets plus one plus one so pumps your legends and each non-token creature you control gets plus one plus one for each creature you control with the same name as that creature so that last ability actually kind of hilarious if you want to go deep with persistent petitioners or things like that that you can play any number in your deck like shadowborn apostle shenanigans seems really really hilarious there the most interesting part though is this is the new and improved mirror gallery mirror gallery the only card in Magic that does what it does, just getting around the legend roll. I was wondering if Wizards would call back to this, but make a new upgraded version because the Mirror Gallery is just way too expensive and slow. It looks like they did exactly that. They made Mirror Gallery, but then they added all this other text on it that might actually make it playable in some format. So the cool thing about Mirror Gallery is it lets you have multiples of the same legend at play. Imagine having multiple Tovalars or Old Gnawbones or Togs rolls on the battlefield. The possibilities are endless. 
and it works for any permanent. So you have multiple Jaces and lulls on the battlefield. So it's just a really, really cool design. I think as far as building around it, you'll probably see this mostly in clone decks. That's the easiest way to get a bunch of the same legend player, whatever Tovalar, clone your Tovalar. The same in Commander, and Commander you can only play one of anything, so this wouldn't really do much of anything. However, if you're cloning something a bunch of times, then the mirror box becomes relevant, and I love how Wizards stack so much text onto this card. Like, mirror gallery just isn't playable. I, even in against odds, it's really, really hard to make it work, but maybe being a legendary anthem and having this weird, you know, persistent petitioner, squadron hawks, grow your stuff upside text, maybe that's enough to make it work. I will warn you, though, the big problem with stuff like Mirror Gallery and Mirror Box is... When things go wrong, it goes really, really wrong. So what can happen with these cards is you play your mirror box, you play your whatever Tovalar, you copy it a bunch of times, you get a bunch of Tovalars, you're feeling really good, and then your opponent is Prismari Commands or a Braids or Skyclave Apparitions away your mirror box, and then the Legend Rule immediately applies again, and you lose all your stuff. So keep that in mind. It's a very, very high-risk strategy, but when it works, Mirror Box is a really unique card. There's really only one other card like it in Magic that allows your deck to do things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise ever so i'm absolutely in love with this card probably one of the first cards i'll build around not because i think it's good but just because i love the hilarious things it can do we also got oh boy some new legendary lands and these cards are bonkers but seiju who endures sakens on a creative uprising and these cards are absolutely absurd so they're legendary lands they come into play on tap they add a mana of their color and then they have channel so you can discard them to get an effect like Beseju. You can pay two and discard it to blow up an artifact enchantment or non-basic land in opponent controls, and that player can search their library for a land with a basic land type and put it on the battlefield and shuffle. The ability costs one less for each legendary creature you control. So can Zana, not quite as strong as Besaju, I don't think, but still, it's a land that comes into play untapped. It adds red mana, and then you can discard it for four mana, maybe get a discount if you have legends, and make two colorless 1-1 one -one spirit creature tokens that gain haste until end of turn. These cards are so, so so good. One of the most powerful things in Magic are lands that add colored mana and come into play untapped and do something, and that's exactly what these are. So, so Gonzana, I mean, essentially, it can be a raise the alarm, maybe an expensive raise the alarm in some situations, but that's attached to a land. Like, this takes me back to MDFCs. To MDFCs and how I'm such a huge believer in the power of MDFCs, having lands that cannot be lands, having a land that can be a raise the alarm, that is just an inherently powerful effect. Also, this helps kids around the legend rule. One of the problems with legendary lands is if you play four of them in your deck and you draw two or three, then you can't really play them or your legend rule yourself. Well, having channel on that means if you draw extras and you already have one on the battlefield, well, then you can just discard the extra and use the channel effect. I think Bisheju is really, really strong. I think this is a card that'll see play literally across formats. I think legacy decks will play it, modern decks will play it, standard decks, commander decks. It, the cost is so low to play this as a one of. Plus, we have all these shenanigans like Expedition Map that can tutor up these lands, you get it off Urza Saga. So I think that Biseju has staple level play. It's something that can blow up a Tron land, it can blow up the big constructs from Urza Saga. There's a lot of possibilities and it's just really, really easy to play it in your deck. The only downside is it doesn't say that the player tutors up a basic land. It's a land with a basic clan type. So this does mean you blow up your opponents, whatever. They can get a watery grave. They can get an original dual land. They can get a triome. So there is some mana fixing, but still, worst case, make it as your land drop. Like, if there's nothing good to blow up, it's an untapped land that adds colorless mana. So I think this land cycle is staple level from standard all the way back to modern, maybe even in legacy. Definitely in commander. These cards are just absolutely bonkers and going to see a ridiculous amount of play probably be really in demand and pretty expensive. We also got some weirdness in the reality chip. So the reality chip, I don't even know what to make of this card. Two mana, zero four, legendary artifact creature equipment jellyfish. You can look at the top of your library at any time. As long as the reality chip is attached to a creature, you can play lands and cast spells from the top of your library. Reconfigure for three. Reconfigure means attach this to a creature or unattach it from a creature. You can only do it as a sorcery. Why attach this isn't a creature? So 
essentially what this is, it is, I don't even know how to describe this. This is a two mana zero four that for three mana can turn into an equipment. If you equip it to something, well, then all of a sudden you're going to have this really crazy ability where you can play everything off the top of your deck. So this is a yoke tox that once you put it on another creature turns into a future site that lets you just play everything off the top of your deck. I really don't know what to make of this card. I really don't know what to make of this card's power level. Is being an equipment creature a downside because you play it as an equipment and it can die to infernal grasp or get bounced by fading hope is it an upside because it's a creature that can lead or turn into equipment so we can block things like usher the fallen or werewolf pack leader we've never seen anything like this before in the game's entire history this creature slash equipment hybrid uh, as far as actually playing with it the one thing i want to mention is to really take advantage of the reconfigure you're going to want creatures around so it might be tempting to play this in like uh, blue white can control deck with very few creatures but that's probably going to go poorly you do need a deck with a reasonable amount of creatures to take advantage of the configurability just a legendary zero four two mana wall that doesn't seem very playable where i think this will probably shine is in commander and when you think of commander I want to think, okay, people are just going to play this fairly, like a Corsair or a Crufix, like a Vizier Menagerie. They're going to play this as our commander and do all these cool value-y things. But in reality, people are probably just going to go infinite with this card. Like, it goes infinite really easy. Sensei's Divining Top, any sort of cost reducer. Assuming you have reconfigured it, then all of a sudden you just keep playing top, putting it on top of your deck, draw through your entire deck, get a ton of Storm Count, win whatever, Ether Flux Reservoir, just win by drawing your entire deck. So the reality chip... The card's really neat. It's just a really, really unique design. The reconfigure mechanic is really interesting. Gonna be hard to figure out how strong it is until we get to play with it, because we've just never played with anything like it before. My guess is it's less good than it might look, but it's still probably pretty good. My main concern for this one is its creature mode is kind of meh. Like it's an okay blocker, but really its power is being reconfigured and allowing you to cast everything from the top of your deck. So we'll have to wait and see, can there be a deck that this fits in? Like I said earlier, you would think, oh, this would be great in some sort of control deck, but in controlled, can you reconfigure it consistently enough? Do you need to be some sort of aggro deck? If you're an aggro deck, do you want a zero four wall? So we're gonna have to wait and see. Worst case, really cool commander. And I mean, that type line is something else. Legendary artifact creature equipment jellyfish. What could be better than that? Next up, we got Kyoti Soul of Kamigawa. Pretty interesting, smaller legendary dragon spirit. So with three mana, three, three with flash and flying. When it enters the battlefield, another target permanent you control gets indestructible for as long as you control Kyoti. And then you pay a mana of each color, give it plus five, plus five until end of turn. So Kyoti, this is like a, a really, really massively upgraded Aegeus Angel. Same kind of ability, except you get flash. It's much cheaper. I guess you get that pumping upside, which I know don't think it'll happen very often but still a, a very very big upgrade over a gs angel which is good because the gs angel pretty far away from being playable it also reminds me a little bit of like restoration angel or archangel avison these creatures that you can flash into play to save one of your things with the upside of coyote being well the indestructible sticks around as long as coyote does and it can target non-creature permanents so i imagine you just wait till your opponent demon bolts or infernal grass whatever you flash this in fizzle the removal spell keep your thing around I will mention, some people said, oh, well, this would be sweet to save my Planeswalkers. I noticed people saying this on social media. Doesn't really work that way. The thing with Planeswalkers is, if their loyalty hits zero... They go to the graveyard. So even if your Tamiyo is indestructible, if its loyalty is all gone, it's going to go to the graveyard, even if it's indestructible thanks to Kyoti. So it doesn't really work with Planeswalkers the way that you want it to. On the other hand, it can save a Panharmonicon, which is pretty big because Panharmonicon dies all the time these days, or your Prismatic Bridge, or a Lair of the Hydra, any permanent on the battlefield. So I think that Kyoti is a pretty reasonable card. I could see this being like a one of, maybe a two of in 60 card formats. As far as commander is concerned, I think this is more of a 99 card. I would play this in the 99 in maybe like Ur-Dragon, maybe if even like Kenrith or something, you want to protect your, your Kenrith from removal. On the other hand, as far as being a commander, I think this might be one of the least powerful commanders, five color commanders we've seen. Uh, I mean, is it worse than a Togatog? Maybe not, but at least a Togatog, you get this sweet meme value and Kyoti doesn't really have that. So I think I would consider playing it in the 99, but not excited at all to play this as my commander. It's just kind of a boring commander. So Kyoti, I think it's got some potential in formats 
that's like standard. Just as a Wii to save your stuff from removal. And then Commander, yeah, might show up in some five color decks. Next up, we got Goro Goro Disciple of Ryuzi, a two mana 2-2 two -two legendary goblin samurai. Can pay one to give creatures you control haste until end of turn. Pay five to create a 5-5 five five red dragon spirit creature token with flying, but you can only activate it if you control an attacking modified creature. Modified, another new keyword, I guess. Is that even a keyword? But it basically, it means a creature that has an aura on it is equipped or has a counter on it. So Goro Goro, I'm mostly excited about this as a way to give everything haste. Uh, there's definitely combos where you really want to give your entire team haste for them to work. Reminds me of Kenrith in that way. Just one man to give everything haste. And it's not a crashing drawbridge. Crashing drawbridge, the problem is it itself suffers from summoning sickness. So it's got to sit on the battlefield for a turn to work. Goro Goro is a card that you can put into play off a Genesis wave or a Patriarch's bidding or a living end and give your entire team haste to close out the game right away and I think that's a really powerful ability. On the other hand, the dragon making ability, I don't know, kind of just reminds me of Dragon Kin Berserker. I think outside of the mass haste part of Goro Goro, it actually feels like a almost strictly worse Dragon Kin Berserker. It doesn't have first strike. It's always going to be five mana to make a dragon. Uh, so I feel like Goro Goro We'll have to wait and see. If this sees play, I think it's going to be because of that haste ability. But who knows? Maybe the modified creature thing is better than I think. We also got Timashi Reality Architect, a new moon folk wizard legend. Two mana, two, three. Whenever one or more non-creature permanents are returned to hand, draw a card. This ability only triggers once each turn. And then pay white and X to return a land you control to its owner's hand. And you can return an artifact or an enchantment card with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Activate this only as a sorcery. So Tamashi, as long as you have an artifact or an enchantment in your graveyard, you can essentially pick up a land, reanimate one of those, and draw a card, which that's a lot of value. And you can do that repeatedly. Like, bouncing a land is a drawback, but still, I imagine playing this maybe with Sagas. Sagas were the first thing that came to mind for Standard, because these are enchantments that put themselves in the graveyard eventually. At least the old ones, the new Kamigawa ones don't work as well, because they turn into creatures, but Binding of the Old Gods or Waking the Trolls or the Raven's Warning. Play them, get your value out of them. They go to the graveyard, pick up a land, draw a card with Tamashi, get them back, do it again. That seems like a pretty solid value loop. Also really cute if you have lands that you want to pick up. Maybe you are playing MDFCs. Maybe you're playing uh, the new legendary land cycle like Baseju. With Tamashi, you can play your MDFCs as lands early in the game so you can cast your spells. And then later in the game, you can use Tamashi to bounce your seed gate restoration and draw a bunch of cards or battle get recovered to get something back or shatter skull smashing for removal so i think that's something else to keep in mind normally bouncing lands a drawback but with all these weird land spell cards we have these days there are situations where it'll actually be an upside once you go back to like modern or commander using this to like reanimate urza saga ancient dead mishra's bobble like zero mana artifacts essentially with urza saga tamashi is pay one white mana reanimate urza saga from your graveyard and because you're bouncing a land you're gonna get to draw a card so bounce a land pay one mana reanimate urza saga that's a pretty sweet value loop or like ancient den get that back from the graveyard mishra's bobble to draw more cards although at the same time once you get back to modern i think it is fair to wonder like is tamashi if you're trying to reanimate uh, these cards, Ancient Dads and Mishra's Bobbles. Maybe Luris is just better. Maybe Emery is just better. Although the Urza Saga loop is something that's definitely worth keeping in mind because Urza Saga is already so powerful and Tamashi synergizes really, really well with it. I mean, you can even pick up Urza Saga earlier. Like, it works on both levels. You can get it back from the graveyard because it's an enchantment land and by bouncing another land or you can just pick up your Urza Saga maybe after the second lore counter so you can make a big construct, pick it up, reset it to do it again so lots of synergies there. So we'll see how it shakes out in modern. I think in commander, there's a few ways to build around this. This can just be a bounce commander. Because remember, it says whenever one or more non-creature permanents are returned to hand, it doesn't say your hand. It's, this isn't just triggering off you bouncing lands to activate Tamashi. So you can Cyclonic Rift and draw a card into the Royal Draw card only once each turn. But still, that's a lot of card advantage if you want to play a bounce deck. You could also play it as just kind of a Azorius Reanimator style deck, something like Hana Ship's Navigator 
Alligator. I think that Tamashi could serve that role as well, probably much better than Hannah, really. And then, I think it's interesting as a Moonfolk commander because it gets you into a second color. Moonfolk from the past, they all care about bouncing lands, so bouncing lands with your Maloku or your Uro are still going to trigger your Tamashi, and then Tamashi lets you have white mana in with your blue, which I don't think any of the old Merfolk did. They were all blue-based, so this lets you expand into another color, get some new cards in your deck, so I like Tamashi quite a bit. I don't know how it'll shake out in 60-card formats, but I think at a minimum, a really cool build around Commander, and I'm excited to use it to pick up some MDFCs and do some Saga shenanigans in Standard. We also got a new vehicle in Surge Hacker Mech, a 4-mana 5-5 vehicle with Menace that when it enters a battlefield, it deals damage equal to twice the number of vehicles you control to target creature or planeswalker and opponent controls. Crew cost pretty steep at 4. So is this card good? I think as a vehicle, without its ETB trigger, the answer is no. On the other hand, if you can somehow be a deck with multiple vehicles, this could actually be pretty good. Like Surge Hacker Mech by itself, Enters a battlefield two damage to a creature planeswalker, and eh, that's not exciting. If you get up to two vehicles, then you're getting four damage to a creature or planeswalker. Then you kind of got this weird vehicle y flame tongue cravio. You still suffer from the high crew cost, but still, I mean that could be something worth considering. If you get a bunch of vehicles, then this kind of turns into a ravenous chupacabra that can also hit planeswalkers. So we'll have to see. We've seen some synergies. We've seen Tezzeret turning on artifacts. We've seen other artifact synergies coming in this set by itself in a vacuum i would say that surge hacker is more of a limited card but if we get enough synergies to support it or we get a dedicated vehicle deck with azika's chariots and colossal blow and omen kills and all the new kamigawa stuff then this could be a pretty solid removal spell that works with the theme of the deck we also got invoke despair which ah as cool as this card is Pretty sure it's a bulk rare. Four black mana plus one. So five mana sorcery. Target opponent sacks a creature. If they can't, they lose two life and you draw a card. Then repeat this process for enchantment and a planeswalker. So essentially, let's say you cast this for five mana. Your opponent has a creature. They don't have an enchantment or a planeswalker. Your opponent is going to sack a creature. They're going to lose four life. You're going to draw two cards. Is that worth it? Eh, I'm not actually sure. I lean towards no, especially considering the four black and the mana cost. That is a really restrictive mana cost. Plus, it's five mana removal and it's at sorcery speed. It is nice that you're always going to get some value, but let's say your opponent has nothing to sacrifice. This is five mana, you draw three cards, your opponent loses six life. Uh, even that's not really exciting. No matter what combination I think of with this card, none of them makes me excited to actually cast this card, although it is mentioning... Yet another black enchantment destruction spell. This one definitely power down, I think, compared to Feed the Swarm, since it's an edict and it's pretty expensive. But still, it seems like we keep getting more black enchantment destruction pretty much ever set. So Invoke Despair... <sighs> Got pretty epic art. It's a, one of the promos for the set. As far as being playable, I'm just really not seeing it. We also got Scrap Welder, kind of a fixed version of Goblin Welder. Three mana, three, three Goblin Artificer. You can tap it, sack an artifact with mana value of X to return target artifact with mana value less than X from your graveyard to the battlefield, and it gains haste until end of turn. So this goes back to Goblin Welder, Goblin Engineer, definitely a very fixed version. Like Goblin Welder just sacks an artifact to get back an artifact. Effect. There's just no mana restrictions, anything like that. Goblin Engineer had a three mana value restriction. Scrap Welder, it seems pretty safe to me. I do think it could be like a fun value card. Maybe a play Azekas Chariot and sack it. You get to keep the cats and get back a coaster gargoyle. So you venture, then you sack it, then get a poet's quill to learn. So there is fun like value loops you can do with the card. Although it's hard for me to see how it would be broken. I think the best I could come up with as far as just breaking this card would be in older formats where you have affinity cards like Mirror Enforcer or Sojourner's Companion. Those are cards that you can cast for almost no mana, sometimes literally no mana, even though they have a high mana value. And then you can like sack Sojourner's Companion, a seven mana value card, and reanimate a Bolus's Citadel or a God's Pharaoh statue. So maybe that's a way to go about it. Take advantage of the fact that affinity cards have high mana values, but are really cheap to cast. I think worst case, seems like a card that'll show up in artifact decks in Commander, back up to Ready, uh, in Brea decks, any sort of artifact style deck. It seems like a pretty powerful recursion option. So Scrap Welder, 
definitely not Goblin Welder, but we don't get cards like Goblin Welder in Standard, so we'll have to wait and see. This is another one that right now when I look at Standard, I'm like, huh, okay, I can do some fun things with it, but there's not anything super crazy. But once we get to Brothers War and we get Urza and Mishra and more artifacts, this might be a card that ends up going from, you know, a fun budget card to like a legit top tier card once we get more artifacts in the format. So even if it doesn't make sense now, it might in another set or two. Finally today, lower rarity speed run. Secluded Courtyard, actually really good. Kind of like an unclaimed territory, but it comes into play tapped. That makes it worse than unclaimed territory, but still, if you're playing some sort of tribal deck, lands that add mana of any color for your tribe are going to be worth it. I think this card is going to see a lot of play in tribal commander decks, standard decks, maybe even like budget modern decks. Juke, Naturalist, and Enthusiastic, Mechanaut are pretty aggressively costed for what they do. Two drops that either make enchantments or artifacts less to cast, and they have upside flying and lifelink so why it's going to take a specific deck for these cards to work they're definitely worth keeping in mind they're just costed so cheaply that i wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of competitive deck that could use them go shitani of shared purpose of note because it's a shrine a four mana one three legendary enchantment creature shrine it is vigilance being near end step you can pay one if you do make a one one colorless spirit creature token for each shrine you control so it's weird to see shrines as creatures although the big deal is this this is another set of shrines if you're not familiar with shrines they all care about the number of shrines on the battlefield we had the original kamigawa cycle the Honden cycle then we got the sanctum cycle in m21 well now we got this new cycle that means stuff like sanctum of all gets better uh, the more shrines the merrier when it comes to a shrine deck so even though i think being a creature kind of a big downside because it means gonna die to creature removal i think this does go a long way towards powering up shrine decks in commander in historic in modern and whatnot we also got spirited companion which i think is the best dog of all time two mana one one enchantment creature when it enters the battlefield draw a card this is essentially the white elvish visionary flibblethip duskly gonzala these are cards that have seen a ton of play across formats but white has never gotten one before now it has it i think this card probably going to see a lot of play just because it's doing something that its color has never done before finally a bunch of random comments check them out over on mtdpreviews.com and that brings us to the end of her first dose of daily Kamigawa Neon Dynasty spoilers. So I'm not going to give you any big wrap up. You can probably hear my voice is like completely falling apart. I've had a cold or something the last few days. So my apologies for losing the voice, but let me know what you think in the comments. This set is looking amazing and awesome. The new Planeswalkers, the mythics, the crazy sagas, all that stuff. Let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching everyone. I'll be back tomorrow, hopefully with more of a voice for more daily Kamigawa Neon Dynasty spoilers. Until then, have a spectacular night and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.